Yes, indeed. He was called the Mutz King. In truth, a small man, sitting close by the fire to cast as large a shadow as possible. Long ago, his kingdom stood tall above mountains, dragons, and men alike. A kingdom known as Poborin, a kingdom where the sun did shine upon all those who wished to bask in it. Proud knights and fair ladies walked the streets, living in harmony amongst the farmers and blacksmiths and potters and bakers. Each a small part of a larger whole, yet none more important than the other. This age of light continued for many years, yet, as with all things, its end would too soon approach. It was not an army which conquered his kingdom, nor was it a natural disaster. In the end, it was his own greed. At the loss of his trusted companion, the creature Pobo, Maximus the Mutzking, poured over ancient scrolls and tomes in search of a way to bring him back. And in the end, bring him back he did, yet he was no longer the same trusted companion he had once known, and soon the streets of Poboric would run empty and the Mutzking was driven from his home. Ah, uh, yes, I remember a time when kingdoms thrived and the sun did shine, when knights of gold would protect the weak. These are the times which I now seek. Though gods nor devil will now answer my plight, I will not go without a fight. I will not go gently into that good night. I will rage. Rage against the dying of the light. Legends of old. Of all fantasy stories, from softs are some of the most intricate and detailed out there. Dark Souls is from softs legacy, you could say. Yes, Demon Souls came first. Yes, Elden Ring is bigger, more popular, and one game of the year. Yes, Bloodborne is often considered to be the better game. It doesn't matter. When you hear the name From Software, you hear Dark Souls. These games changed gaming forever because it showed the world that there is a market for games with a ruthless design philosophy. Games that challenge their players both on their skill and their intellect with these ruthless bosses which have combos longer than this video and this intertwining, winding fantasy story only discovered through environmental storytelling and cryptic item descriptions. I'm not here to tell you that if you haven't experienced a Souls game yet, that you're not a real gamer. I don't think that's a productive mindset at all. I am here to tell you that if you have never experienced one of these games before and you're kind of interested, you should definitely try one. Don't pay attention to the waves of gatekeepers telling you that if you can't overcome a specific challenge, you're bad, or if you use an objectively good build, you're not playing the game as intended. If you hear me suggesting Dark Souls and you still think, no, it's not for me, that's fine, more power to you, honestly. These games are an entertainment product in the end, so if you don't enjoy ramming your head against a wall for an hour straight to get past a specific challenge, that's completely understandable, honestly. Us Dark Souls players are fucking crazy. Alright, let's take a step back for a second. Dark Souls, as everyone knows, is not FromSoft's first Souls-like title. That title goes to Demon's Souls. And as everyone knows, Demon's Souls wasn't even FromSoft's first game. That title goes to Kingsfield. Kingsfield is a series of dungeon crawler games, the design of which really heavily influenced f uh, further Souls-like games. If you're interested in those games, go watch the Iron Pineapple videos on them. Uh, he's a smaller creator that I'm trying to support by shouting him out here. From also made a franchise of mech fighting games known as Armored Core, uh, which recently, in 2023, got its sixth game in the main series. Those are cool, but they're not why we here. Let's talk about what is in my opinion one of the greatest gaming trilogies of all time. Let's talk
Before we can talk Dark Souls though, we have to talk Demon Souls. And before we can talk Demon Souls, we have to talk Hidetaka Miyazaki. If you know anything about the development of FromSoft's games, you know about Miyazaki's involvement in them. Having started in 2004 as a planner on the Armored Core series of games, Miyazaki heard about this RPG, adventure RPG title that the company was working on called Demon Souls, and he got really invested in the project. Now, as far as FromSoft was concerned, Demon Souls was already a failing project, so Miyazaki was able to very easily inject his own ideas into the project, because what's another idea to an already failing failing project. And guess what? It failed. Released in 2009, it took another few months after release for Japanese publishers to even consider releasing the game outside of Japan. Though with the late success that it did see, Miyazaki's influence was very much recognized and he was promoted to game director for its spiritual sequel, a little game called Dark Souls. And with that, the ball was rolling. With the immense success that Dark Souls saw, Miyazaki got the insane promotion to president of FromSoft. Uh, he went on to direct such amazing games as Elden Ring, Bloodborne, Sekiro. Dude worked together on Elden Ring with my favorite modern author, George R. R. Martin, and in my headcanon they even kissed. So yes, while it is true that game development is done by more than one person, hell, as of last year, June of last year, FromSoft employed around 400 people, which is pretty small for a AAA studio, I am here to say that Miyazaki's influences and his inspirations taking from Western fantasy can really be felt in the Dark Souls and Elden Ring and even Bloodborne games. You really feel that this man's ideas keep these projects together. It is very well known that Miyazaki has his hands, his fingers in every single pie during development. He looks at assets, he looks at lore, he looks at music. Now I'm not here to keep tooting FromSoft's horn, let's say. Many reports have stated that many of their employees are overworked and underpaid, as many game developers are in the industry. Then again, perhaps since the massive success that Elden Ring saw, that has changed slightly. We don't know. FromSoft as a game development company is very closed off and we don't really know what goes on behind their walls unless one of their employees speaks up about it. So what I am here to say is just that Miyazaki himself has a lot of creative juices flowing through him and his love for stuff like Berserk and Western fantasy in general really just elevates these games to another level. He's gonna keep doing that, isn't he? Hmm. This video is about two different things, a real life thing and a game thing, and both of them relate to each other. I'm sure you've heard of this term before, franchise fatigue. Drops in sales for games that have had too many prequels and sequels and spin-offs. Dark Souls as a series is about franchise fatigue or just anything fatigue, really. When is it enough? When should we stop? Should we just keep making more and more games related to popular IP just because we know that the title will get people to buy it? Or should we end our stories on a high note instead of letting them all pile up on this massive drag heap stained by the bad reputation given by once-loving fans? Let me ask you this, dear viewer. Take your favorite game, or movie even, and ask yourself, would you want a sequel to it? Probably yes. <laughs> uh, at least I know that I would want a sequel to my favorite games. This is completely normal. This is what makes franchises, right? You make one good thing and people want another one of that good thing. And the reason why we want that most likely is because our favorite things have most likely not been affected by franchise fatigue yet. I can pretty safely say that almost nobody will call Modern Warfare 3 or Assassin's Creed Valhalla or Far Cry 6 or any other AAA title that's just a previous game in the series recycled their favorite game of all time. Then we come to the Soul series, and I know what some of you are thinking, Yes, this rule applies to them as well. And yes, I don't think that FromSoft can keep making Souls likes the way they are now, with the same kinds of mechanics. I don't think we can have another decade of stamina bar, health bar, Souls gathering games without it getting kind of tired. There's a great video by YouTuber DJ Peach Cobbler titled Elden Ring It Feels Like The End. He's a smaller YouTuber that I'm trying to shout out and give some exposure. In the video, he talks about how Elden Ring taking the Dark Souls formula open world feels like the last new innovation FromSoft can make on their formula. This feels partially true, where I don't really know myself how FromSoft can go further with Elden Ring or with this Dark Souls gameplay loop. Tell me, if, if tomorrow FromSoft announced Elden Ring 2, would you be excited? Yes, 
most likely. If you liked Elden Ring 1, you're gonna like Elden Ring 2, or at least be excited for it, because it's a sequel to this amazing game that you played. It's a promise of another 100 hours of gameplay, having fun and exploring the world, and another 100 hours of Vadi video content. So let's say this, the mechanics are mostly unchanged, but it's a brand new world, and you explore it, and there's new characters, and yada yada, and all the FromSoft goodies of hidden lore, and item descriptions, and characters talking in riddles. It's a success, so yeah, whatever, good. Then say, they announce Elden Ring 3, and it's like, oh, it's it's again an open world game with Dark Souls mechanics, and it's hidden lore, and yada yada, typical FromSoft stuff. And I think you can see where I'm going with that. And then they announce Elden Ring 4, and then they announce Elden Ring 5, and etc, etc. I'm not accusing FromSoft of doing this, because they don't do this, but this is what other French, other game companies would do. What else can FromSoft change about their formula to keep it exciting? Going open world seems like something a lot of games do when they're out of ideas. Halo Infinite, Sonic Frontiers, even The Legend of Zelda isn't safe from the open world. Now, I don't think FromSoft are in danger of franchise fatigue just yet. When it comes down to it, FromSoft's games are mostly about the art design and the combat, how it feels to play not really the type of gameplay. And in every game so far, they have innovated on their types of combat. They have added power stancing, they have added different kinds of attacks, they've added a jump button, which is big. And even beside that, with the release of Sekiro in 2019, FromSoft has proven that they can make an entirely different kind of game and still win game of the year. Alright, let's take a little peek behind the curtain of this video. The script for this video used to be way shorter, aimed for like another 40 minute video like the other three big videos I made. But I don't, I didn't think that would really do because I, I like these games a lot and I want to give them the proper coverage that they deserve. Doing this video in 40 minutes would mean rushing through a lot of these games without stopping to smell the feet, I mean the roses. And uh, doing that really didn't feel very, like, g genuine to me. I, I really like these games and I want to talk a lot about them. So that is why this video is one so long and B so late. All right, let's get into the feet, I mean the meat of this video, with the first game in the series. I'm sorry, that's the last time I'm making that joke. I feel the need to say this for every story-heavy game that I cover or story-heavy media. This video is not a replacement for playing the game yourself. Play the game, it's very good. Play the three games, play all of the FromSoft games, they're all very good. I will explain some of the stories here, the general lore, but it's not the same as experiencing it for yourself. And I will leave out a bunch of details here, because even though I don't want to rush through these games, I can't cover every single boss and all of their stories, because there's just so much juicy lore. So play the games yourself, or watch Fadi Vidya. Fadi Vidya is a smaller YouTuber who I'm trying to give. Dark Souls was released in September of 2011 in Japan and in October of the same year in the West. Uh, it was a console only title at that point. In 2012, fans convinced FromSoft to make a PC port, which was released in August of that year. The game was extremely well received. I mean, people had their criticisms, of course. The, the game was just too hard and unfair. The PC port was locked at 30 FPS. Pinwheel was just too strong. But beside the criticism, most people could could agree that Dark Souls was a great game, and with that, FromSoft had left its mark on the gaming industry. The Soulsborne games are RPGs to the core. They've got stats, and they've got a silent protagonist you can project your deepest, darkest thoughts onto. Souls games are so different from other action RPGs when it comes to their combat, just because of the way the fights flow. Souls battles are more like dances with your opponent. Once you've figured out all of their moves and are able to dodge with all of their combos, you're, you're kind of dancing with them along with the rhythm. Every time you attack, it's not just a devil may cry, press the button and it happens and you can just cancel out of it attack. Um, if you press the button, you commit to everything, including including the massive wind-up sometimes of that attack. These wind-ups range from how fast I rage quit after being defeated by Ornstein and Smo for the 50th time uh, to the length of this video. If you do get hit, you miss a dodge, you heal through the use of your Estus Flask, which is basically in-universe bottled light, but in this household we call it Sunny D. The way the Estus Flask works changes slightly in every single title. Uh, I will go over the way they change when we get to those titles, but for now let's talk about Dark Souls 1. So the Estus Flask in Dark Souls 1, you get a base of five heals with it and you can get more heals by leveling up your checkpoints which are called bonfires. You can also spend something called a firekeeper soul to upgrade the amount healed with each drink from your flask. To be honest the healing in Dark Souls 1 is a bit excessive, uh, like you can 
upgrade your flask so much that you have 20 heals with it and no way in hell do you need 20 heals for any battle that's why i like the systems in later games more where you're like you get a maximum of maybe 10 for like a, a, a whole run i think like maybe you get to 15 if you do like a new game plus and you play more you get like every single upgrade for your flask the original dark souls is a game that likes to trick you it starts by teaching you the mechanics it gives you a broken sword and then throws a massive monster in your face you think I'm never going to be able to beat this, but then they give you actual equipment, give you the Estus Flask and really explain like, oh, you can use your environment to your advantage. You can kill these monsters by using, for example, the plunging attack in the first boss. I really like how Dark Souls' first boss is handled. You die, but then they teach you, no, you can overcome it. Whereas, for example, in a lot of other uh, Souls games, the bosses are more, the first bosses are always like, they kill you and then you start the game proper. So it's like, oh, it's a fake out. You're supposed to die here to feel weak. I've never really liked this. Let's take Demon Souls first boss, for example. You go through this entire level, you kill a bunch of things, and then you're faced with this massive monster and you die. And then you're transported to their hub world. And the way this introduces you to, to the game really makes me feel like they're trying to scare you too much, right? You are given a shield and you are told, oh, if you don't use your shield, you will die. And even if you do end up killing that first boss, you get killed by an, an even more impossible foe in a cutscene. It's really disincentivizing the player to play aggressively. So yeah, again, like even in Elden Ring, FromSoft does this. Almost all medieval Soulsborne games gives you a shield as one of the first pieces of equipment you get. And that really teaches the player to just hide behind the shield to avoid taking damage. Let me tell you something, and this isn't some kind of like get good thing, if you get a shield, drop it. Just double hand your weapon. It's way more fun. Unless you like parrying. Parrying is cool, but don't use your shield to just hide. Play aggressively. Playing aggressively is so much more fun in these games. This is something Bloodborne, for example, teaches you very well. There are no shields in Bloodborne. I mean, there's one, but it's pretty much a joke to say like, use this, we dare you. The YouTuber Age Bomber Guy has a video about how Bloodborne teaches people to play Souls likes. Uh, you should really check it out. He's a much smaller YouTuber. So as mentioned before going on that tangent, Dark Souls is a game that likes to trick the player. At the start, you think these monsters are way too big to beat, and then they tell you you can beat them. The game then tells you that in order to fulfill your destiny, you have to ring to magical bells of awakening, one at the top of the kingdom and one at the bottom. You do this thinking it's your quest, and when it's done, you encounter a massive eternal immortal serpent known as Framped in your hub area. And this serpent tells you your actual quest. Let us do a little lore mode. Light is time. So before light, time did not exist. The world was made of stone, and its inhabitants were these immortal, everlasting dragons with stone scales. The dragons didn't do anything. They weren't malicious, they weren't good. They just were. Then, without warning, there was fire. A powerful primordial flame, and along with this flame came the souls. Along with these souls came four more powerful lord souls, which would bring disparity to this world of stagnation. Underneath the earth, hiding from these everlasting dragons, lived a bunch of different races, different beings, and they all came up and claimed the souls. Then four of those beings claimed the lord souls, and they became their leaders, basically. There was the life soul, given to the witch Isolith, who used it to create pyromancy and another race of beings known as the demons. There was the death soul, given to a lord of the dead known as Nito, who would use it to spread death across the living. There was the light soul, claimed by a man named Gwyn, who used it to lead every other kind of being in a massive war against the everlasting dragons, which he ended up winning, creating the kingdom of Lordran. And lastly, there was the Dark Soul, claimed by someone we know as the Furtive Pygmy, so easily forgotten. This pygmy would become the ancestor to humanity, who are all intrinsically linked to the darkness. When humanity was born, they were made a promise that one day Gwyn's age of light would end and an age of dark would begin. So humanity fought in Gwyn's war. Alongside Nido's dead and the Chaos Demons, they were able to defeat the Everlasting Dragons using the tactics given to them by a traitor amongst the dragon, known as Seath the Scaleless. Seath was a dragon born without the scales, these scales that made these dragons immortal. Being jealous of his brethren, he told Gwyn how to kill them. Gwyn was able to use his lightning magic to pierce the stone scales which ended up winning him the war. Gwyn's army killed all of the Everlasting Dragons, and only a few of their descendants can be seen in-game, including Seath. Seath was made a duke in Gwyn's kingdom. Instead of being killed, Gwyn made him a noble. 
He also married him to one of his daughters so that they may have, may have noble offspring. Once the war was won, Gwyn's Age of Light could truly begin. He built the massive capital of Anor Londo to rule, rule from, and humanity patiently awaited their Age of Dark. Gwyn really feared that this day would come, this Age of Dark, so he bathed humanity in his warm light, convincing them that the warmth was the right way, that their darkness was a bad thing, metaphorically blinding them with his light. Humanity slowly forgot what their original birthright was. He placed around their dark souls a brand known as the Dark Sign, a literal ring of flame around the darkness within humanity's hearts. This act cursed humanity, and they became afflicted with something known as the Undead Curse. Humans cursed with the Undead Curse would return to life after being dead. And after countless resurrections, humans who had lost their purpose in life or had lost their sanity became something known as Hollows. Hollows are mindless creatures who attack anything in sight. Because of this, the undead were shunned and locked away in asylums. And even after all that, the flame began to dim, and Gwyn, in a last-ditch effort, cursed not only humanity, but the world he ruled over. He sacrificed his own soul as kindling for the first flame, which would reignite it and make his Age of Light continue for another age. This started the cycle that we find ourselves in in every Dark Souls game. Whoever it is, someone is resurrected and is sent to become powerful enough to rekindle the flame using their soul so that the Age of Light may continue. This original sacrifice, the original sacrifice of Gwyn's soul, is known as the First Sin, and the effects of this thing would not be shown properly until Dark Souls 3. War mode over. What I have told you just now is the baseline for the entire Dark Souls trilogy. The whole thing about Gwyn placing the dark signs around humanity's souls is not something that was revealed properly until Dark Souls 3, the Ringed City DLC, the very last thing in the Soul series. It makes sense though, for many series like this, where the whole thing is presented to have this very clear black and white perspective, light and dark, life and death. By experiencing the story, you learn that things are more complicated. While at first, yes, you are told to ring some bells, you kill some gargoyles, kill a daughter of the Chaos Witch, Isolith, you are then carried to the capital of light, Anor Londo, where you fight the best duo fight in any Souls game, uh, Ornstein and Smo, and then a daughter of Gwyn tells you that actually your quest is not to ring these bells, but to kill a lot of powerful beings so that you may sacrifice yourself to the first flame to keep the Age of Light going. The thing about stories in these Souls games is that a lot of them are very small, self-contained stories which have already happened. You come there after the fact to discover their stories through the environment and the item descriptions. But you usually find characters or bosses at the end of their rope already, which is when you end up killing them. It's very rare in these games that you actually find someone who is in the middle of their story. The stories, the big story has already happened, and all the characters you're fighting are people who are just involved with it. What you do in the game is learn of their fates after their story has already ended and forge your own path forward. Dark Souls at its core is a series about moving on, about how moving on is a good thing, and how keeping things the same and how lingering in the past will lead to rot and stagnation. Kill the daughter of Gwyn and realize that she was just a hallucination created by the actual last living descendant of Gwyn. Shh, we're not talking about you yet. Gwyndolin, a femboy of the old world, tells you to kill his own father, absorb his soul, so you can light the fire again and keep this age of light going, baby. This desire to keep the flame burning is making this family of gods turn to kinslaying. And the worst part is that if Gwyn heard about this, he would probably agree. So you do this. You go around the game world, fighting a bunch of powerful beings to absorb into your own soul and make yourself strong enough to face the end. Seath was granted a piece of Gwyn's soul after he was made Duke, and he now resides in the archives. He has gone mad searching for a way to become immortal like his old brethren. Nito resides in the deep dark tombs hidden underneath Firelink Shrine. Not much is known about him. He was a bringer of death and you return him the favor. The Witch of Isolith and her children all experienced their unique and individual horrible fates. Abandoned, cursed, turned into a giant tree. I mean, here on the Mutsken channel, we all love a bit of big tree, but I mean that like this, not like this. Lastly, four kings of an old human city were also given pieces of Gwyn's soul. These kings were consumed by the Abyss, which is spreading throughout the land. We'll talk about the Abyss in a bit. At the end of Dark Souls 1, you see what it means to rekindle the flame. Gwyn originally sacrificed his own soul to keep the Age of Light going, but his body remained. Gwyn has become what is basically a hollow. Cursed to the same fate he cursed humanity to. With his death, we are given two choices. One, 
The obvious, rekindle the flame and continue the Age of Light, told to us by Framd. The other option, a lot harder to come across, given to us by another immortal serpent like, like Framd, but hidden in the deepest, darkest pits of the Abyss, someone known as Kath. Kath tells us to extinguish the flame and let the Age of Dark consume the land. This is the last and main trick the game plays on you. It really makes you question whether this perception of light versus dark is as simple as we think it is. And yes, the answer is no, it's not. If we believe Gwyn, on the surface, light is good. Dark is bad, humanity had to follow light or become hollow and turn to darkness. So yeah, is this the case? No. I don't think it's a spoiler to tell you it's never that simple. Not only are there a lot of bad people on the side of light, but a lot of these stories about these bosses show you that you're not really a force of good either for killing them. You're just an undead with a mission, and those standing in your way shall either move or be moved. The canon ending, in my opinion, is the rekindling of the flame. You have to jump through a lot of different hoops to even unlock the option to extinguish the flame, and I don't think that's possible for anyone on their first playthrough. The Age of Fire continues, and it isn't gonna end for a long time yet. And that would be the end of this segment, if not for the fact that I completely left out the DLC, Artorias of the Abyss. This DLC explores the fates of some of Gwyn's most trusted knights, especially Artorias. The DLC takes you to an entirely different kingdom known as Ulusil, uh, where the Abyss is consuming everything. Now what is the Abyss? The Abyss is darkness made manifest. It is most likely a result of Gwyn's original sin. He locked darkness away, basically forced it to keep away for much longer than it was intended, so I think the abyss is kind of the darkness trying to take over the world by force. It is slowly creeping upwards from the bottom of the world. Artorius's mission was to fight the abyss, but in the end he was also consumed by it and we fight him. Deeper and darker down into the abyss we come across these entities that look a lot like these items we've been using called humanity. This is humanity in its purest form, just dark sprites of black ether, and they reside in the abyss. Here, in the deepest, darkest parts of the abyss, we find Manus, once a primordial man, now completely consumed by violent darkness. It is revealed that one of the primordial serpents, probably Kath, caused the citizens of Ulusil to dig too deep and unveil this creature Manus. It's not known how exactly Manus became this way, all that is known is that he is causing the abyss to spread ag as aggressively as it is here, so we kill him too. Dark Souls 1 is special. It's a game that's not afraid to test its players, even more so than the later games. Platforming sections that feel horrible to go through, bosses that seem way too fast compared to your own movement speed, hidden walls behind hidden walls behind hidden walls. This sense of exploration, the, the, the feeling that behind every wall, on top of every rooftop, there could be something hiding for you to find. That is what makes this game, and every other Soulsborne game, so special. They make you feel like you're discovering the secrets of this game alongside everyone else. And the small multiplayer aspect of the game, where you can leave messages for each other, really helps in this aspect. While the Soulsborne series is not focused on multiplayer, it is able to achieve a real sense of community just because of the fact that we all have to go through the same things. Well, guess I have to take care of this then. Let's see what I can do. So you may have seen this image float around the internet. It compares Hideo Kojima's uh, very easy mode for Death Stranding to Miyazaki's commitment for a single difficulty in the Souls games. I was originally writing a full script based on this idea alone for a small video, uh, but then I, while writing this script I thought why not just insert it in here since we're talking about Dark Souls anyway, you know, when in Lord ran, you know? So before we get started, here's my opinion on the matter. Both perspectives are incredibly valid in their own separate ways. I would say that the image was originally created to bait out some angry Dark Souls gatekeepers, but it's actually an interesting thing to talk about. Hideo Kojima's perspective shows his love for the medium and his willingness to share this experience of video games with everyone, no matter their skill level. It's not surprising that Kojima would feel this way. If you look at Kojima games, they are almost comparable to movies. They are like something that appeals to everyone. Plots intertwine as lore is spotted at you by 10 different characters at the same time, while explosions and fight scenes happen in the background. I've often heard it said that Kojima should be directing movies instead of making video games. I disagree with this, by the way. I don't think Kojima should be making movies. I think he is perfect for the games industry, not because of his stories or his set pieces or his characters, but because how his games feel. His games are 
games to their core. You couldn't make a Metal Gear Solid 3 movie simply because it would lack all of the charm that game had. Kojima's titles, Kojima's projects, really convey the best thing about this medium, the pure fun and wackiness you can get from a game. Eating tree frogs, creating a time paradox, plugging in your second controller into your console to defeat a boss. Having characters in your game comment on how ridiculous certain gameplay mechanics are. Having a Street Fighter-like boss fight at the end of your AAA walking simulator where the final boss refers to himself as the final boss. And then there's just the ridiculous writing that would never work outside of a game. I mean, otaku convention? Big boss? Imagine a movie where it turns out that the main villain, the antagonist to the character Solid Snake, is someone called Liquid Snake. Nobody would take that movie seriously, but through the medium of video games we are able to suspend our disbelief a bit. It is just a game, after all. We are able to get immersed in the ridiculousness just because of the genuinely um, engaging gameplay of Kojima games and also the just generally fun atmosphere. I love it. This is where I feel like a game like Death Stranding falters a bit. It takes itself way too seriously. Now that isn't to say there isn't a good amount of ridiculousness in this game, hell from the like system to the monster energy to this character using the Metal Gear game over screen as a visual aid while explaining lore to you. <laughs> There's enough here to remind you that it's just a game and you're supposed to have a good time with it. It's just that the game gets really bogged down in lore being explained at you or you having to read lore or tutorial after tutorial interrupting your gameplay, even though the standard gameplay loop is not that hard to understand. The game spends so much time seriously explaining itself that you get really lost between what's supposed to be silly and what's supposed to be taken seriously. Anyway, this isn't a review of Death Stranding, this is an exploration but of these two ideas. Let's move on. The simple fact that Kojima games are so gamey uh, makes me feel that giving them a very easy difficulty is a great decision. It allows people who are not familiar with games to experience what a game is. As I said, Kojima games are games to their core, so it's a very good introduction to the world of video games for people who have never played one. This all without them getting stuck on difficult sections or hard bosses like we Souls players often like to do. The Souls games in contrast are a horrible way to experience games for the first time. Even if you give us a difficulty slider, imagine playing Dark Souls 1 for the first time if you've never played a video game before must be so unintuitive. Besides like basic movement controls, this game has nothing close to ordinary storytelling, ordinary exploration, you have to jump across rooftops. No normal person would think, oh now I have to go across the rooftop. These games are fully designed around overcoming these challenges together. And if other players could have easier difficulties or harder difficulties, that would really ruin this concept. There would be no way for an easy player to help a hard player with a boss, and if a hard player were to help an easy player with a boss, then the balancing would be all off. Especially in PvP. Dark Souls is special because it unites gamers against this very difficult challenge to overcome. To some, saying that you've beaten a Souls game is like a kind of badge of honor. So in conclusion, games with difficulty sliders are a great way to introduce new people to the medium, whereas Souls games are a great way to show players what they can do with the skills they have acquired from their gaming experience. Oh, oh damn. He's still going at it. Let's wait here for a while. Ooh, Estes Soup! Dark Souls 2 was not directed by Miyazaki and is therefore often seen as the worst Dark Souls game. That being said, Dark Souls 2 has the highest Metacritic review score out of all the Dark Souls games and it also won a bunch of awards, including the Golden Joystick Award in 2014. Remember the Golden Joystick Award from the Alan Wake video? You did watch the Alan Wake video, didn't you? So I guess sometimes people are just wrong. I'm not gonna say which side is wrong in this case, that is for you to decide. All I'm gonna say is, Dark Souls 2 is my least favorite of the Souls games, of the FromSoft Souls games, but also I have played many other games which are way worse than Dark Souls 2, so you know, in the end, I like just having a, another decent game to play. I feel on some level it's the design, the level design, and the story elements which contributed to this uh, all around negativity towards this game. Dark Souls 1's world its interconnectivity was a massive part of why that game was so popular. You know, everything was connected in physical space. You got shortcuts through the entire world that connected back to the main hub world. It felt great to traverse. And in Dark Souls 2, that is not the case. Thick forests lead into lakes of lava, which exists on top of open castle courtyards. Physical space doesn't really make much sense in this kingdom. The same thing is true for its enemy placements. Dark Souls 2, compared to Dark Souls 1, has often very random feelings enemy placements with groups of very strong enemies paired together that just 
kill you in what seems like an unfair combo. <laughs> the biggest mechanical changes though to Dark Souls 2 were the way your Estus Flask works and also the dodging mechanic. Now, instead of having the base 5 charges in your Estus Flask, you have a base of 1 and you can upgrade the amount of charges you have in your Estus Flask by finding items called Estus Shards. Healing with your flasks also takes a lot longer than in Dark Souls 1. You heal over a period of time instead of almost instantly. They also brought back a mechanic from Demon Souls, the life gems, uh, which are consumable healing items. These life gems are not farmable, however, uh, they are only purchasable. So in the end, if you have a lot of souls, you can really have your inventory overflowing with them if you want to. The way dodging works in this game is the worst mechanic ever introduced into anything ever. You now have to level up a specific stat to increase the amount of invincibility frames you have when you dodge. You now need 20 levels in this stat ADP to get the same role you had in Dark Souls 1. It just causes you to waste a lot of your time leveling up this stat, which just feels like you should have from the beginning. I don't like it. All right, let's talk about the story and its themes now. Dark Souls 2 is a game about not being the main character, about knowing that you are not at the center of the world, that you're not really that important in the grand scheme of things. It also takes the concept of the undead curse from Dark Souls 1 and really explores it in more depth. This game does not take place in the kingdom of the gods, uh, nor at the place where the world will end. Instead, we find ourselves in Drang Lake, a human kingdom like any other, ravaged by the undead curse. Where the first game was all about cycles, how the end of one thing can mean the beginning of another, this game has almost nothing to do with that. This game is all about the undead curse. It shows how the actions of Gwyn and all the other big lords from the first game have lasting consequences that don't affect just them, but everyone in the world. The consequences aren't limited to the big players. The, it's mostly the small people that suffer from it, the humans who become undead. This can be seen as a commentary on, are you ready? Politics. Politics. To quote my favorite book series ever, A Song of Ice and Fire, the common people pray for rain. Healthy children, a summer that never ends. It is no matter to them if the High Lords play their Game of Thrones, as long as they are left in peace. They never are. We ourselves play as a human who is afflicted by the undead curse. We come to Drang Lake, this kingdom, in the hope that we can find a cure to our curse there, only to find out there is none and the people there have been dealing with the undead curse in their own special way. For example, the Undead Purgatory is a location in Dark Souls 2 where the undead were locked up and are being held prisoner and being tortured for all eternity. The boss in that location is the Executioner's Chariot and it is basically a big machine that is used to just constantly crush the undead again and again and again into dust, who then just rise again to be killed again, etc, etc, etc. Hints of this kind of treatment could be seen in Dark Souls 1 as well. The starting location, the Undead Asylum, where we wake up in the beginning of the game, is a place where undead were just imprisoned to await the end of the world. Yes, undeath was seen as a literal curse by the living, and those afflicted by it were seen as lesser than. And yes, sometimes they were even seen as monsters. Now, an undead is far different from a hollow. A hollow is created when an undead creature dies so many times that they lose their purpose in life. And this is something you see with many of the NPCs in the in the trilogy. A lot of the people you meet, the final piece of their questline is them turning hollow. You either help them or make them fail their purpose in life so that they have nothing left to do and they just attack you. Let's get back to Dark Souls 2. In the first game, we played as a literal nobody. Yes, though eventually we were named Chosen Undead. We were just an undead who went around the world killing bosses because, well, it's the end of the world. What else am I gonna do? At least at the start of the game. In Dark Souls 2, we play as someone with a lot more purpose. Drang Lake, much like Lordran was, is beyond its prime. Its people are undead or hollowed, and its buildings only stand as husks of their former glory. We learn throughout the game that its former king, a man named Vendrick, was given the option of rekindling the flame, but refused. And this brings me to another major theme of Dark Souls 2, choice. Vendrick's refusal to either rekindle or extinguish the flame shows us that our undead in Dark Souls 1 was lied to. There aren't just two options, you can also just do nothing. Vendrick made this third choice, I mean that is to say he made no choice at all. He would not extinguish the flame, he would not rekindle it. He would just wait for the end to come naturally. Vendrick spent his life not looking for a way to perpetuate Gwyn's mistakes, but to look for a solution to them. He spent his life looking for a cure for the undead curse that Gwyn caused. And it's stated in game that he almost succeeded, but when we do find him, he is, is nothing more than a mindless wandering hollow. 
while he was kind, Vendrick also ended up being seduced by someone known as Nishandra, who is the final boss of Dark Souls 2. She caused Vendrick to focus his efforts on a war against the giants instead of on curing the undead curse. She did this to control him with the ultimate goal of having Vendrick rekindle the first flame and she could then claim it for herself. She may even have been the cause for the undead curse spreading as rapidly as it did in Drang Lake. And when Vendrick realized what she was doing, he locked himself away in a tomb so that Nashandra could not complete her actual goal. When we kill her, we do rise to the true throne of Drang Lake and we make our own choice. <clears throat> yeah, okay. <sighs> Man. I forgot how pretty this place was. From's art direction is top notch, like like some of the best stuff I've ever seen in gaming. I usually don't do this because I'm a huge narcissist, but I'm just gonna show you a bunch of FromSoft screenshots without me being on screen for a second. From castle architecture to city streets, from vast oceans to majestic caverns, from hidden temples to massive cathedrals, From Software's art direction and level design is second to none. The culmination of this point is a game like Elden Ring. Every single area you visit, no matter which angle you view it from, could be captured and put on a wall in a museum. This is massively impressive for an open world title. In all honesty, it feels impossible for an open world title. Yet FromSoft managed to pull it off somehow. Rhea Lucaria, Inside and Out, Volcano Manor, Stormvale Castle, the Albanuric Village, Castle Redmain, Lanedel, the Earth Tree, the Forge of Giants, the Halic Tree, and Elfell beneath it. There's just so much to see. It's hard not to have moments playing these games where you just stand still and stare in awe of what you're seeing. These massive set pieces which perfectly convey the tone of the area or the themes of the game as a whole. You might tell me, well Mutz, actually FromSoft aren't the only people who do this. Look at a game like God of War 2018 or Ragnarok for example. They have these massive things in the distance which add to the environment. And you'd be right. There's a major difference, though, between Jormungandr and the Earth Tree. Yes, both are long cylindrical boys, but that's beside the point. One you can actually travel all the way towards and is always present, as large as it should be in physical space, rendered in and in view. The other is only there as a skybox, to be interacted with during cutscenes and a very specific segment of the game. The whole everything is really there in the distance thing in games makes them way more immersive than just a developer adding a cool skybox in the background that you can never actually touch. YouTuber Jacob Geller has a great video about this topic called Games That Don't Fake The Space. He's a smaller- There you are, old friend. You've ruined my kingdom. Have at thee! Ah! Ah! Actually, I'm doing a video about Dark Souls right now and I only have one game left to talk about, so do you mind if we do this later? Yeah, thanks, I'll be back with you in a sec. Get this bit out of the way, the biggest change in Dark Souls 3's healing is that now life gems are gone and your Estus Flask heals way faster. Dark Souls 3 is a game about letting things die, about how death isn't the end, but just a stepping stone for new things to be born. The game shows us that if we hold on to a dying thing for too long, it may lose the aspects that made it alive to begin with. Weirdly, in contrast to this, the main menu music is very energetic and, and epic, uh, almost like a last hurrah for the series. I mean, look at this. This is what Dark Souls 3 looks like, and then this is what Dark Souls 3 sounds like. The flame has been rekindled time and time again, and with it comes the pus of man, a sickness born from the abyss, which is still spreading even since before Dark Souls 1. The immense amount of time that has passed is causing reality to distort. The world is being merged together, myriad kingdoms from all across the world are being crushed into each other through the sheer force of entropy. It's a sort of allegory for our own universe, where one day everything will die, all of the stars will be dead, all of the black holes will have died out, but there will still be these little pieces of nothing, of matter, just floating through the abyss. Some scientists have theorized that one day that mass will come closer together, just like the kingdoms in Dark Souls 3, and by being crushed so close together they will explode in a new Big Bang, a full universe reset. I, I really like that idea, an, an infinite loop of universes being destroyed and created and destroyed and created over and over again. I, I find it kind of beautiful. But in Dark Souls, time is taking its toll on the world that has been established through two games already. 
An entire race of beings, the demons, has been either wiped out or is standing on its last legs. We can encounter one of these demons, the first actual boss in the series, the Asylum Demon. We can find him standing, and he is old and weak and almost turned into stone from time. And still, they want to rekindle the fire. Now, much like how it would happen in our own world, not everyone sees eye to eye on this. Prince Lothric raced to rekindle the fire, refuses to call when it's time. In a desperate attempt to keep the fire going, Previous Lords of Cinder are resurrected to do this again, but when they also refuse, that's when you are resurrected. You play as Unkindled Ash, an amalgamation of all different people who previously tried to rekindle the flame using their own souls, but instead burned to ash, failing. You're not a chosen undead, you're not a bearer of the curse. Instead, you're an amalgamation of all past failures merged into one. You are a last resort so that you may go around the land, kill all of these traitor lords who left their posts, and use their strength combined with yours to rekindle the first flame again. Throughout this game, you travel through the kingdom of Lothric. You can see there the rot and stagnation that's been spreading due to the constant rekindling of the first flame. This game is a lot more sad than the others. Your main bosses here are the Lords of Cinder, and each of them have their own little sad fates that cause them to refuse rekindling the flame. There are the Abyss Watchers, who were established to follow in the footsteps of the Knight Artorius from Dark Souls 1. Their quest to fight the Abyss eventually led to them being infected by it. When you enter their boss room, they are locked in eternal combat, simply because it is their goal to fight the Abyss wherever it is, and since the Abyss is within them, and also they are unkindled ash who keep being resurrected, that means they just keep killing each other over and over and over again into eternity. Then there is Yorm the Giant, who ruled over a kingdom of humans who distrusted him greatly. He gave both them and one of his best friends a weapon that could kill him, just to say like, Hey, here's a weapon that could kill me. Do it, coward. If you think I'm such a bad ruler, kill me. He also used to have a shield along with his great machete, uh, but once the person he loved died, he dropped the shield and used his machete two-handed just because he didn't have anything worth protecting anymore. It's really sad. By the way, that best friend that Yorm gave the weapon to is Sigurd of Katarina, one of the many NPCs that I have skipped over <laughs> during this video. Um, Sigurd is what is the what is called the Onion Knight, who is someone who reappears in several FromSoft games, at least in different forms. He's also in Dark Souls 1, at least as a different character, but with the same armor and voice actor. I haven't talked about the NPCs in this game, and while, yes, Dark Souls 2's NPCs are a little bit disappointing, a lot of them are very memorable, like Solaire, like Sigurd, like like Henri of Astora and her trusted Sentinel Knight. All of the dozens of shopkeepers who laugh menacingly at you when you buy something from them. The first ever D&D campaign I was a part of had a blacksmith called Andre, who was based on the blacksmith from the Souls games. Every time he, we met him, he said, What needs smithing today? Which is just a straight up quote from Dark Souls. That person who ran that campaign really liked Dark Souls. And that's why I'm so attached to that guy. <laughs> it's one of my fondest memories. I don't know if you know, but I like D&D. Anyway, the last Lord of Cinder on our path is one called Aldrich, Devourer of Gods. As his name suggests, Aldrich, the Devourer of Gods, grew a taste for not just god meat, but also human meat. Uh, his cannibalistic tendencies led to him eventually devouring actual gods. He got visions of an coming age of the deep sea that he would help cause and rule over. When we fight him, we can see he was in the middle of devouring one of these gods. Gwyndling, the femboy twink from the first game, No. And lastly, there are the aforementioned princes, who are the whole reason you're in this mess. They refuse to rekindle the flame and are hiding up in their castle. I'll also quickly mention the Nameless King boss fight because I kind of alluded to him in the Dark Souls 1 section of this video. Uh, the name is Kling. The nameless. The name is Kling. The Nameless King can be found in an optional area of the game called Arch Dragon Peak. He was also a son of Gwyn, who was erased from all history and banished from the kingdom because at some point he started to ally himself with dragons. Now Gwyn didn't really like that. Dragons were his big old enemy. Remember from the lore section of the first game? So yes, even this game has more proof that Gwyn was not a good. Dad. The final boss of Dark Souls 3 is called the Soul of Cinder, and contrasted to you, instead of being an amalgamation of failures, he is an amalgamation of successes. He is an amalgamation of every being before you who has already rekindled the flame. You can tell this because he employs various different fighting styles that players would have used, different weapons, different rings that players could use in the previous games. Bringing him down to his second phase, you realize that yes, even the first person to ever rekindle the flame is not spared this fate, being crushed into this being with thousands of others. He adapts the moveset and also the boss theme of Gwyn. This game tries its best to convince you that sometimes death is better, 
And in the end, after you've killed this final boss, you are given the same choice you were given in Dark Souls 1. And this time I think the canon ending is the death of the first flame. Just look at this cutscene. This is what you see when you rekindle the first flame. It's, it's almost pathetic. This scene takes place at a location far into the future, known as the Dreg Heap. Everything that has once existed has now been crushed together into dust. Kingdoms bend and distort, warped by time immemorial. You sit alone, taking what little is left of the first flame and just setting yourself alight. Sitting down and waiting for the end. It's sad. D disappointing, even. You expect your victory, your sacrifice for the lights to mean something greater. But in the end it's just something sad and small and disappointing and you prolong the suffering of a dying world. I didn't really talk that much about the DLC for Dark Souls 1 and I didn't talk at all about the DLC for Dark Souls 2. I'm sorry about that by the way Dark Souls 2 fans, but it just doesn't add that much to the overall story. Uh, but I will talk about the DLC for Dark Souls 3 just because they give a lot more context towards the actual end of the series. In the first DLC you are sucked into a painting by a man named Gale and then you fight a bunch of cool bosses, uh, one of the best boss fights in Souls history, and then you meet with a little girl, a painter. She sits and waits for her uncle, Gale, the man who sucked you into the painting. He is going to bring her the pigment she'll use to paint something beautiful. So yeah, Gale is the guy that brought you here, he brought you to this painted world. Painted worlds were introduced in Dark Souls 1, again a section I didn't talk about, go play the game, it's really good. But they are basically worlds within paintings, and they have their own cycles of light and dark, except in this world, in Ariandel, it's a cycle of Rot and fire. The final boss of this section, Father Ariandel, has been using his own blood to douse the flame that is rising within a big bowl that he has. Uh, this flame threatens to turn this world into an age of fire instead of an age of rot, so he uses his own blood to douse the flames. I see flame <laughs> flickering once, once again. again. Not, Not enough, enough blood yet shed. shed. My, my flail. Bring me my flail. When you eventually come to kill him, he becomes so angry that he basically throws the flame everywhere and the Age of Rot ends and the Age of Fire begins. Then you'll find that a new path, the second DLC, has opened to you in the Dreg Heap, the place beyond time. You can follow in the footsteps of Gale, who has left messages behind for you, to follow him to wherever he's going. Wherever he's going is the Ringed City, a massive city that stands at the literal end of the world, the edge of the world. This city still seems to stand in glory. Though the first flame has all but faded, a big, bright sun still warms the city below. This is until you find Filianor, a daughter of Gwyn left behind, who is keeping this place this way, in stagnation basically. She is holding a crumbling egg, and when you wake her the egg fully crumbles, causing time to start up again. Or not just start up again, but skip forward the many hundreds or thousands of years that this city has been in stagnation. You are brought to the real Ring City, dark and dead and covered in dust and bones. This is where you fight the real final boss of Dark Souls. At the end of the world, Two beings are still alive. You and Gale. Gale has come to this place because it is a city given to the first pygmy lords. He came here to consume their souls, their dark souls. They are pygmy, they have the dark souls that the first pygmy ever found. Mixed together with his blood, these dark souls would make for the perfect pigment for the painter to paint herself a new world. So in the end, we kill Gale, who has gone mad through the consumption of so many different dark souls. We bring his blood to the painter, who begins to paint her new perfect world, cold, dark, and very gentle. She calls this painting, this world, Ash after us. Or, if you're a narcissist, she calls it Florimple. This is the real end of Dark Souls. And it is a way, in my opinion, for FromSoft to say, yes, this world may be ending, but we can paint another one. FromSoft are the painters here, making these worlds which we can Mario 64 dive into and explore to our heart's content. It's not because this is the end of their most well-known series that their vision ends. <laughs> To go back to what I said earlier about the big crunch, about the idea that our whole universe will, in the end, after it's died out, come back together again and explode into a new universe. I think Dark Souls really embodies this idea. That an end is not an end, but just an opportunity for something new to blossom. Some people like to think that the painting that the girl is making is Bloodborne, or actually the Yarnum. Uh, since she's painting with blood and darkness, uh, that world that she's making might end up becoming the world of Bloodborne, but that's neither here nor there. Think about it this way. FromSoft used every game before Elden Ring and merged them all together and took the best bits out of them and from it was born Elden Ring. And I'm not saying that Elden Ring is the culmination of all of FromSoft's past experiences, but I think th that they 
use their games that they have already made, and once they have ended, they use them to make something new. They take the best things from their worlds and put them into new worlds to make the perfect little game. This is something that I must share with everyone who is going to start writing a story. Even if you don't know the twists and turns that your story will take along the way, make sure you know where it's headed. Make sure you know in what way it should end. Endings are incredibly important in fiction. They give the story that you're consuming their meaning. They allow the audience to reflect on the past. They allow them to analyze how characters or even the world got where it got in the end. Now that isn't to say that you can't start a story and the ending can't change while you're writing it. All I'm saying is that you need to have a point to work towards instead of just aimlessly writing tens of thousands of words that don't go anywhere in the end. I'm glad that Dark Souls ended with the third game because if I see, if I look at what FromSoft has created since Dark Souls 3, I can't wait for what they make next. Let's take a quick look at Sekiro and Elden Ring. I'm not talking about Bloodborne here simply because it came out between Dark Souls 2 and 3 so it's not really after the series, uh, but I am definitely thinking about making an entire video about that game once I actually get to play it, Sony. Donate now to my Patreon or become a member of the YouTube channel so I can buy a PlayStation and a copy of Bloodborne. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice was released in 2019 and ended up winning Game of the Year. This is both a complete surprise and completely expected to be. It's a surprise because this game is entirely different from all of FromSoft's previous projects. When it comes down to its gameplay, the combat feels entirely different, fights are handled way differently, so it's a completely new territory for FromSoft. So the fact that they did it and it managed to win Game of the Year is so surprising, but then when you play it, it's not a surprise at all because it's a really good game. It has a great story, it has great imagery, it has great feeling combat. Where Souls combat focuses on taking hits where you can and dodging through hits when possible, Sekiro really makes you stay locked into combat. You are in there, you are with the enemy and you are parrying constantly. The only way to defeat your enemies in Sekiro is by hitting them over and over again with your sword, deflecting their attacks, making them stagger so you can finish them in one single death blow. Also, it has a grappling hook. <laughs> Just like I said before, they took everything good from the previous games, they mashed them all together, and from it was born something new and beautiful. A singularity, if you will. Elden Ring is the perfect game. It doesn't lie to the player about what it wants to be, and it doesn't stop anyone from experiencing it. Elden Ring's huge variety in its different kinds of builds and its open world structure allows anyone to experience the game in any way they want. Use Mimic Tier if that makes your game more fun, because guess what? These are entertainment products, they're supposed to be fun. Elden Ring, when released in 2022, instantly became one of the greatest games of all time. Also winning the Game Awards, Game of the Year award, uh, again for FromSoft, making FromSoft the only studio that has ever won that award twice, <laughs> so far at least. All that's left to say after that, I guess, is that the end of Dark Souls as a series has left the door open for FromSoft to make even more special and different things, and I, and I just can't wait to see what they make next. Alright, I'm done. Uh, let's do this. All right. No, no, no. What the? Oh dear. Must have taken a wrong turn at the side exit. Where am I? Oh. <laughs> Hello there, didn't even see you. My name is, uh, well, it doesn't matter. You can just call me the doctor. Uh, what year is it? What the fu- Ah, oh, well, <laughs> doesn't matter. I should get going. <sighs> well, that was unexpected and lazily written. Well, I guess with that, I'm king again? Uh, I mean, all of my citizens are dead, but at least I still have all of my material possessions. Yay! So, as my quest has ended, so too has this video come to an end. It's been a good time hanging out with you. Just you and me, talking about Dark Souls and learning a lot about each other as well. I'm sure we'll meet again, you and I, once our Lord above Mutskin decides to make another medieval-related video. So, since I guess you're my only citizen right now, um, I guess there's only one thing really left to say, and that is Boboric 
life tax, just living in the city, is uh, 50 ducats per month. If you own any property in the city, that's gonna cost you 100 ducats per month based on the property. If it's a large property, which I will determine whether your property is large or not, it's gonna cost you 150. Uh, if you own any businesses within the city, hey, hey, it's, gonna cost you uh, it's been a bit. Per month. I hope you can see why. Uh, combining my real paying job with wanting to make quality content for you guys takes a bunch of time. So thanks for waiting if you did. Thanks for subscribing if you did. Like couple things before I go. So thank you so incredibly much for 300 subscribers. That's more than I ever thought I'd get. So, you know, thanks. Uh, next goal is a thousand, I guess. Uh, more stuff is coming in the future. Uh, I once said that I tried to upload every two weeks uh, and then this project happened. Uh, I'm gonna try to keep it frequent, but doing two weeks for a 40 minute video, that's gonna be costing quality. Uh, so expect shorter videos in between. Uh, just to keep the balance of quantity and quality. In other news, I also have a Discord, which I've had for four years, but shh. Uh, you can now join it via the link in my YouTube uh, about thingy, uh, or like wherever the social media links are stored nowadays. Uh, not much activity there yet, but uh, you can get more easily notified of new releases, plus you can hang out with me and my friends. Uh, currently, we're playing a lot of Helldivers 2 and also a bit of Sea of Thieves. Uh, so feel free to join. I'd love to hang out with all your cool folks. <laughs> oh, and lastly, if you have any other games, series, books, movies, or abstract concepts pertaining to the deep questions about the universe you want me to cover, uh, comment something. If not, also comment something. It's good for the algorithm. <laughs> Alright, uh, that's it for me for now. Uh, I hope the next video won't take as long. Uh, I can't promise anything I know myself. But still, thank you guys for watching, thank you if you stuck around until the end, and I hope you all have a very, very, very lovely evening.